Botanically speaking, sweet potatoes are part of the convalets, the con convalets, yeah, conval convoluted, convalet, conval this family. They're part of this family. Boy, this is gonna be a tough one. The sweet potato is one of the most important food crops in the world. 90% of production happens in Asia, where most sweet potatoes are white fleshed, though some are purple, and they vary in levels of sweetness and starchiness. If you can get your hands on Japanese white sweet potatoes, do it. When roasted, they are rich, sweet, and chestnutty. Yum. Here in the States, it's easiest to find one of three kinds of sweet potatoes, and they're all orange fleshed and definitively sweet. And they have incredible names. We've got the Beauregard, the Jewel, and the Red Garnet. Sweet potatoes sound fancy, and I guess when it comes to the science behind them, they kind of are fancy. So let's do some fancy science. When we talk about fresh produce, we're pretty much always trying to limit storage time after harvest to avoid spoilage or just bad things happening to the food. We want fresh food, and rightfully so. But with sweet potatoes, we actually want them to be old. Well, maybe not old, old, because we've all seen sweet potatoes sprout, right? You haven't seen that? Oh my God, they throw up these beautiful shoots and leaves. Take a look. Sorry, getting off track. We don't want super old sweet potatoes, but we want ones that have been stored in a cool, dark environment for a certain period of time before they end up at the supermarket. Why? because sweet potatoes in storage are changing in a really cool way. Sweet potatoes contain special enzymes called amylases that break down starch into sugars. Because I was born in the 80s, I like to think of the enzyme as a big Pac-Man chomping down on long chains of starch and spitting out tiny little sugars. But now, that's how you're gonna think of it too. Sorry. So how much of an impact does storage have on sweet potatoes? Well, up to 27% of the starch in the sweet potato can be converted to sugars in a period of 10 weeks. That's significant. But it doesn't have to stop there. Those enzymes work faster and faster as the temperature increases, all up to the point at which they die. Enzymes are so dramatic. In the 140 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit range, these enzymes are working overtime. During cooking, amylases can convert as much as 75% of the starch in the sweet potato to sugars. Wild. You can take advantage of this fancy science in a couple of really cool ways. Let's go to the kitchen. Exhibit A, roasted sweet potatoes. Place coins of seasoned sweet potatoes on a baking sheet, cover with foil, place into a cold oven, and then turn on the heat. That gradual climb in temperature, slowed further by the wrapped baking sheet, means that the sweet potatoes spend a lot of time in that literal sweet spot. You get less starchy, slightly sweeter sweet potatoes with lovely caramelized exteriors. Exhibit B, sweet potato soup. To make a smooth, not too thick sweet potato soup, you normally have to add a lot of liquid to thin out all of that starch. And all of that extra liquid means less sweet potato flavor. If only there was a way to cut back on some of that starch. I don't know, convert some of it to sugar. Guys, there is, that's what we've been talking about. We just bring our cooking liquid up to a simmer, remove the pot from the heat, and drop in our cut up sweet potatoes. Let them hang out in their warm little enzyme bath for about 20 minutes, and just check out the difference. This is a batch where we used that step, and this is a batch where we didn't. Crazy, right? Roasted sweet potatoes, sweet potato soup, even sweet potato casserole, all great dishes, but none of them holds the title of best sweet potato dish because that title belongs to sweet potato fries. And the only thing better than how awesome sweet potato fries are to eat is how easy they are to make. You just slice them up like this and cook them in 325 degree oil like this until they're crisp on the outside and creamy on the inside. Then hit them with a little bit of salt and mmm, mmm, these are, mmm, these are, I'm enjoying these. These are really, these are really yummy. I recommend eating these. Okay, so I have to be honest with you. What you just saw me doing there was acting. I didn't actually enjoy those fries at all, but I was acting as if I did. As much as I wish it was that easy to make sweet potato fries, it just isn't. It's challenging to make good sweet potato fries for the exact same reasons that I've just been gushing about. Sugar and the conversion of starch to sugar. A high sugar content does not lend itself well to fried foods. Starch is what hydrates and crisps when we fry food, and sugars just brown, burn, and get in the way. So with sweet potatoes, it's easy to end up with fries that are golden brown, even dark, even burned, and still soggy. It's a total bummer. But if you're thinking to yourself, I get good sweet potato fries at restaurants all the time, What's the deal? The deal is that those fries are enrobed in a starchy coating. The starchy coating gets crisp, the inside turns sweet and creamy, and everybody's happy. The good news is we can do this at home too, and we can do it better. We're gonna make thick cut, super crispy sweet potato fries because I love that contrast of crisp exterior and lots of creamy interior. So we'll cut nice thick wedges out of these Beauregard sweet potatoes. We already saw what happens when we straight up fry these, so we're not doing that. Instead, we're gonna boil them for a couple of minutes in water that is spiked with salt and baking soda. You'll see that after just a few minutes, the exterior of these potatoes has turned mushy, which looks pretty gross, right? 
Wrong. This is exactly what we want to have happen. The baking soda raises the pH of the water, which speeds the breakdown of pectin only at the surface. So these are mushy on the outside, but still undercooked inside. Now we just transfer these guys while they're still nice and hot to this bowl where I've whisked together water and cornstarch. And we fold and fold and fold and fold. A couple of things are happening here. First, the cornstarch is gelling thanks to the heat from the sweet potatoes. And second, that mushy exterior is coming off and mixing with that cornstarch batter, turning everything a lovely orange color. Trust me, it's lovely. And boom, now we have sweet potato wedges that are still pure sweet potato on the inside, but they're coated in a higher starch sweet potato mixture on the outside. You thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, it's time to fry. We're gonna use a nice cast iron skillet here to give more space to each wedge and cut down on sticking. Oh my God, look at these beauties. Actually, you know what, forget about that. Listen to these beauties. Look, I'm kidding. I don't. I don't need this celery. Actually, get out of here, celery. It's not your episode. Just listen to the sweet potato fries. They are crisp, crunchy on the outside, sweet, dense, and creamy inside, and perfect for dipping in spicy mayonnaise. I love them roasted, I love them in soup, I love them twice baked, but at the end of the day, there's really no debate. This is how to eat sweet potatoes. Thanks for watching. Now, if you haven't already, come find me at testcook on Instagram. Anytime that you make a recipe from one of the shows, tag me in it so I can share it with everyone. We all wanna see it. And don't forget to hit subscribe. See you next time.